Hello, everyone. My name is Nagesh Batula. I'm the Senior Principal Product Manager of Oracle Sharding. Uh, welcome to this webcast. Uh, what we're going to talk about today is the uh, product overview of the brand new Oracle 12.2 feature, namely Oracle Sharding. <coughs> Uh, first off, safe our statement. Um, what we're going to talk about is a general outline of the uh, product direction. Uh, you should not get into any contract based on what you heard today. Right, the agenda uh, is simple, but it is a content-rich material. We do have a more, almost 50 slides that we'll cover in the first 45 minutes, and in the last 15 minutes, we'll do uh, Q and A. Okay. Uh, the first item will be, will be that uh, we'll introduce you to Oracle Sharding, what it is about, and what are the advantages and uh, and the key capabilities. Uh, we'll, we'll discuss at length on the concepts and architecture and use cases as well, and we'll summarize at the end. Okay. Right. Let's begin. Uh, Oracle sharding. What is Oracle sharding? Right? It is basically a database architecture pattern um, that renders linear scalability and total fault isolation. Right? And in essence, it entails horizontal partitioning of data across n number of databases. We call them shards. And each of these databases have their own dedicated CPU, flash, memory, and disk, and all the local resources. There is no shared storage. There's no clustering uh, technology that's used here. In essence, it's a, a loosely coupled system. Right? And each of these shards holds a subset of data. And, and then this subset, again, is replicated for overall availability. And then in the first release, the number of shards in the Oracle Sharded database uh, will be 1,000. That's the limit that we have set in the very first release. If you look at the picture on the right-hand side, uh, what I'm showing there is a simple table, uh, table one, that is sharded across n number of shards. Right? By doing so, basically, I'm storing a set of partitions in each of the shards. So partitions A, B, C, D in the shard one, uh, e, F, G, H, and SHA-2, so on and so forth. And each of these databases have their own server, right? And then and there is no shared storage, there's no clustering, as I said before. Although the data is distributed across n number of shards, to the application user, to the, to the clients, um, the sharding platform makes it appear, or gives, it, gives an illusion to the end user as if it's a single logical database, right? At the physical level, yes, the data is segregated across multiple shards, but logically it's one large database, one logical database. And because it's a loosely coupled system, the shade nothing um, architecture pattern uh, gives a couple of key benefits. One is linear scalability. As your workload data and, uh, and the concurrent users grow, all you would do is add more shards to the existing pool of databases, right? and you would achieve linear scalability because there are no dependencies uh, amongst these shards. So this shard doesn't, never, will never contact another shard, so on and so forth. There's a, they're all independent uh, databases, and they are loosely coupled. Right? So you get linear scalability of data, workload, and users. That's number one. And it also offers another interesting uh, high availability characteristics. We call that maximum fault isolation. If I lose one or more shards, only the data in that shard is unavailable, but the rest of the shards are still available for application uh, service, right? That's one. And then the second characteristic is the mixed database releases. I could have hundreds of shards, but uh, some shards could be in 12.2, some shards could be in 13.1, et cetera, right? They know, there's no requirement that all the shards have to be in the uh, same version. Now, the first question that um, comes to anybody's mind is, what kind of applications can I run uh, against a sharded environment? Right? Uh, what we're talking about here is companies from any industry vertical, whether it's a billing system, ticketing system, financials, social media companies, who have a requirement of massive scalability and high availability and are willing to design custom OLTP applications. We'll talk about what those custom OLTP applications are in a bit, right? But what we're not targeting are, are applications such as PeopleSoft, SAP. Those are not the applications we're targeting. So we're targeting custom OLTP applications whose characteristics are basically, number one, 
these applications will primarily do single shard operations. Basically, the applications pass a sharding key, a distribution key. Based on that key, we route you to the right shard, which has the data relevant to this particular key. And the application does its transactions on that shard um, and then exit out. Right? That's the primary method of operation. Right? Think about um, any telco or, for that matter, iTunes. You, you, you send your account ID or email ID, and the sharding platform will take them to the uh, right shard, which has your data, and you do your transactions, and you, you get out. Right? Think of that pattern. Those are the single shard operations. Right? We do support two kinds of patterns. That's the single shard. The primary usage pattern is single shard. We say 80% of the transactions should be single shard operations. We also support an ancillary usage pattern. These are uh, multi-shard operations. What if you have requirements for batch processing, such as uh, simple reports or analytics? Um, we support that also. But what we're saying here in the first release is 20% uh, or less of workload will belong to that characteristic. Right? So in summary, these custom multiple applications should be able to specify the key to get the optimal performance. And 80% of the workload will be single shard operations and 20 or less will be the uh, multi-shard operations. Um, couple of uh, use cases for Oracle sharding versus traditional approach. When would I consider that? Again, um, when my requirement is uh, I have single shard operations I want to do, but I want to get extreme scalability for my uh, web scale uh, transaction processing application databases. That's number one. What if I want to have a fault isolation wherein failure of one shard does not take my entire application service down? What if I have a requirement uh, for fault isolation, then sharding is a great fit for that. Geodata distribution is another interesting one. The two characteristics that come under that, data residency and data proximity. Data proximity is nothing but uh, you want to bring data close to your uh, consumers, so, this, so you'll reduce the network latency uh, between the data uh, and the uh, application. Right? And then data residency is another interesting one. Uh, many customers have expressed this requirement wherein they want to store uh, the user data uh, in the country of citizenship. It's a regulatory requirement that they want to honor. Right? And if you have such a requirement, Oracle charting is a great fit. And the last one is low cost hardware. Uh, if you have a requirement where you don't want to use uh, shared storage, whether it's SAN, NAS, etc., um, here is an opportunity where you can establish a very large scale database without any uh, shared storage. Right? Here are some opportunities uh, for Oracle sharding versus traditional approach. Now, sharding in general renders great benefits. We talked about scalability, fault isolation, but what does Oracle sharding bring to the table? Right? So here I have a list of key capabilities that Oracle sharding gives you. First of all, it's a complete platform for the end-to-end -end life cycle of a sharded database. Right? Uh, what do I mean by that? Number one, um, as part of sharded, uh, sharded database platform, we provide auto deployment and that includes the application configuration. So if I have 100 shards, right, the creation of 100 databases and the replication, whether it's Data Guard or Golden Gate, is automatically done for you. Right? All you would do is specify the with an enhanced DDL of how you want to lay out your topology, and we build uh, the systems for you, build the databases and the replication for you. We'll talk about all these details in the next slides, but at a high level, let me touch upon what are the key capabilities. The next thing is the data placement policies. Uh, we give you policies with which you can set your geodistribution nature. You may want to say, I want some shards on the cloud, some shards in my local uh, data center, or some shards in Europe, some shards in American data center, or the hybrid as well. Right? We allow you to um, create the topologies with simple uh, DDL specification. The next bullet is the sharding schemes. We we support three high level, three different uh, types of sharding schemes. One is consistent hash based partitioning of data across the shards. Uh, the other one is range or list. Uh, range or list is categorized under user defined sharding. Consistent hash, uh, what we call it as a system managed sharding. And we also support composite methods. What if I want to do range consistent hash or list consistent hash? We support that also. So in the sharded database, you have n number of shards, let's say for example 100. Now if I want to propagate my schema to 100 shards, um, if I had to go do it in every shard, it would be a laborious activity, right? So what we, what we have done uh, to simplify the schema maintenance is we have, uh, we'll allow 
customers to go to a central uh, shard catalog uh, from where you will propagate your DDLs. You create tables, create table spaces, etc., from your shard catalog. And our shard directors, in conjunction with shard catalog, uh, make sure that these DDLs are propagated to all the hundreds of shards. Right? So shard directors and shard catalog, they together uh, make the shard management and shard routing layer. Okay. And the next thing is data dependent routing for single shard and cross shard queries. Uh, a platform provides DDR, which is data dependent routing, wherein if you specify a key from the application side, right, our shard directors are instrumental in routing those connections to the right shard based on the key that you have provided. That's a single shard. If you don't provide the key, let's say for batch processing, et cetera, we also support cross shard queries, and that happens through the shard catalog. So you connect to the shard catalog, uh, run a bat massive batch SQL uh, without providing any keys, et cetera. And the shard catalog assumes the role of a coordinated database and uh, executes the queries on your behalf. And I'll talk about how it's done, the internals of it in the next few slides. Right? So in essence, data dependent routing with single shard as well as cross shard queries. The last thing is very interesting, the elastic scaling and auto rebalancing. I start with 50 shards, let's say, now I want to um, expand my capacity, I want to add more shards. Right? We allow you to elastically scale your sharded database, add shards, and then we automatically rebalance the data across all the shards, right? So these are at a high level uh, key capabilities of our platform, okay? Now, architecture-wise, uh, what are the key components? Uh, let's talk about it, right? On the left-hand side, if you see, I'm showing two regions. It could be two sites, and I have my clients. Application servers typically run uh, Oracle integrated clients, such as the OCI, uh, ODP.NET, uh, JDBC, uh, UCP, et cetera, the typical Oracle integrated clients that we normally use, um, those are supported as part of the application server. And then um, we have a set of shard directors. These are nothing but global service managers. Uh, if you have used GDS, the global data services, that was released as part of 12.1. Uh, these are the shard directors that we have enhanced in support of sharded database. So typically you'll have um, some uh, shard directors in one region, some in the other for the overall availability. And these shard directors are instrumental in routing as well as overall shard management as well. Okay. Shard catalog is a simple 12.2 database. Um, it, it contains the overall metadata of the sharded database. It contains the gold schema of the application. Um, and also it performs the uh, cross shard queries on your behalf. Right? It, it does those. And of course, it needs to be protected for uh, high availability and disaster recovery. So it, you do have a uh, standby for this catalog database. Now, this is the shard management and shard routing layer we talked about, right? Now, let's go deep down, and now we see the data tier. In this data tier, I have, in the system managed sharding, the first case that we talked about, I have a shard space, which uh, basically talks about all the shards in the uh, sharded database, right? I have one shard space in the system managed database. And in, this, in the shards, in the shard space, can be logically segregated as uh, two different shard groups in this example. Shard group one uh, could be all the databases in the primary, and shard group two could be database in the standby. Right? And each of these databases are automatically configured for data guard with fast start failover. Right? If uh, a database, in this case red, is down, automatically fast start failover will kick in, and um, this database in the shard group two will become the primary. Right? And we do it at the database level, not at the group level, that failover that I just talked about. Okay. So now, uh, in terms of what are the technologies that we built, uh, shard, this sharding platform um, is not an acquisition. We have not written it from the scratch. It's a pure integration of time-tested technologies that Oracle always had. Partitioning, uh, it's been there for almost a couple of decades now. Um, likewise, replication. Um, we leverage these technologies uh, for um, building the sharded architecture, right? So partitioning is used for distributing your data across shards and replication, whether it's data or, or going gate, is used to replicate data across the um, uh, across these shard groups, right? And then GDS is leveraged big time in terms of um, um, routing as well as the sharded database maintenance and management. 
So automatic deployment um, and replication configuration, the first uh, bullet that we talked about, right? Um, so what do we do at a high level? Um, the first prereq is, of course, you would have a 12.2 database that hosts the shard catalog. It's a, it's a simple Oracle database. And if I have 10 shards, um, uh, you would have to install Oracle software on each of the 10 shards. And of course, you'll have to install the uh, remote scheduled regions on these um, Oracle hosts as well. We'll talk about how the remote scheduler is used later on. And then in addition to this uh, software on the shards, uh, you will have to have dedicated environments for shard directors where you install the GSMs, the global service managers. Right? So that's your prereq. You would create a shard catalog, uh, install the software for both Oracle's, Oracle Home as well as the shard directors. And then um, you will do a uh, declarative specification for the configuration of however you want it. You will say, uh, create shard catalog, um, add shard directors, add shard spaces, add shard groups, and create shards. You just specify it. Basically, you're submitting the metadata, and you run a magic command called deploy. And deploy is the uh, command which uh, basically does the end-to-end -end automation in terms of setting up the shard database. Right? The first thing that it does is um, it uses the DBMS scheduler package and communicates with the uh, remote hosts, um, remote host scheduler agents, and it kicks off the uh, DBCA um, in, in creating the shard database, in um, using RMAN duplicate to create the standbys, and it also does the uh, broker configuration. The reader transport is also uh, configured. Observers are started, and fast start payload is also enabled. It does the end to end automation of deploying the uh, database as well as the uh, standby. Right? And we do the same for Golden Gate in a bidirectional uh, replication as well. Okay, so um, my, my intent here is not to show you the syntax and bore you with that, but, but at a high level, allow you to appreciate uh, how, uh, how simple it is to create a shadow database. Um, I do have viewlets that we can uh, share with you later on um, um, through that uh, we have workspace. First thing is create shard catalog. So you specify what is the database that on which you want to create your shard, shard catalog. You specify what is my shard database administration user is and what's the password and what are the regions that I want to create. In this case, region one, region two. And my shard space, I could take the default or I could have a name for my shard space called customer shard space. And I specify the number of chunks. And I'll talk about what chunks are uh, in a few slides down the line, but for now, uh, just comprehend that there is a concept called chunks um, and that you would have to specify as part of the create shard catalog. And then once the shard catalog is created, you would do shard director um, edition, say add GSM, and you'll give a listener uh, port for the GSM, and you will give the password for the GSM catalog user. Basically, shard directors uh, talk to the catalog database over this user, GSM cat user, and then you give the uh, catalog information and also the region that the shard director is created on. Likewise, you would create however many shard directors you want. Okay. Once the shard directors are created, at this point you do add shard group and you say uh, shard group one uh, deploys primary and it belongs to region one. Remember we talked about in the architectural diagram, there's certain shards in the shard group one, certain shards in the shard group two. That's why you're defining here. And another shard group for um, the standby databases. In this case, it's, they belong to region two. Once you define the shard groups, all you would have to do is create shard and you specify the shard group name and also the destination, the host on which you want to create the database. And then you give the credentials for Oracle. Um, that it's basically the OS user and the password uh, on these shard nodes, right? And you'd establish create shards of however many shards you want, okay? But basically what you're doing now is compiling the metadata, right? And then once the metadata, metadata is compiled, you would run the deploy command, which does the end-to-end -end automation of creation of databases, your data guard, your fast failover, observers, and all the good stuff, right? And then once the de uh, deploy is done, you can create a global service. In this case, I'm calling it as OLTP read write service, um, which will run on all the shards whose role is primary. And this is the service that you would use in the application. So in, from the application connectivity perspective, let's say you, uh, you're using UCP, your URL will list out the shard director listener endpoints, right? And also the service that you want to um, access. 
In addition to that, you also pass the key, the sharding key, which I'll talk about how you pass the sharding key as part of UCP uh, in, in the next few slides. Okay. So in terms of high availability, um, the different flavors of uh, topologies that we support. We looked at this one in the last few slides. Uh, basically, the first topology is using data guard in a faster failover mode, right? Uh, this is the automated uh, deployment and it's a default mode uh, is the data guard. We also support Golden Gate at a chunk level by the direction of the application, right? Uh, if a customer wants to use Golden Gate, yes, they can use Golden Gate in, in conjunction with sharding and then um, if a customer wants to use a rack at the shard level to beef up the node level availability and scalability, they can uh, do uh, Oracle rack as well. Okay. So we talked about deployment. Now let's talk about the uh, sharded schema. So one of the uh, design objective, design goal that we had is we want to make sure uh, a given customer a customer's orders, customer line items are always kept together, right? So when a customer comes in and passes his key, let's say Mary comes and passes her key, all her data, her, her orders, her line items are always kept only within one shard. So at most, Mary would have to go to one and only one shard to access her records. That's our design objective, right? Likewise, other customers also, if they pass the uh, customer ID or or, or sharding key, they would only go to one shard. That's the 80% of the workload that we talked about, right? But in a schema, uh, in addition to the sharded tables, you typically have some tables such as products. These are uh, read mostly or uh, not often uh, modified, right? Uh, maybe it's a batch process that uh, updates once in a while. Uh, those kind of tables, products, geo codes, postal code, etc. We we give you a mechanism. Uh, with which you can duplicate those tables on all the shards, right? So by doing so, your application, um, in, in addition to joining data of customers, orders, and line items, if they want to join with products or postal code, et cetera, you would always do a one shard query. You would never do a cross shard query. You would not span your queries across multiple shards when you provide a key, right? So how do, um, uh, so what did we do to achieve this behavior of uh, giving you the opportunity to put all your related data together in one shot? What we have done is we have enhanced SQL in support of that design objective that I just mentioned. The first thing is the create table space set. So we have enhanced the create table space um, uh, to now to automatically create table spaces across shards. So you will say create table space set. Um, Remember, I, I talked about chunks parameter, which I showed as 12 in when I created shard catalog. So the create table space set, set basically creates 12 table spaces across, in this case, three shards. It could be any number, but in this example, I'm saying three shards. So in essence, I have 12 chunks, right? 12 table spaces I have to create across three shards. That means each shard will have four table spaces. And those are automatically created for you, right? This is in the system managed sharding that I'm talking about. Once the table spaces are automatically created, um, you would do uh, the create shard table for the root table of your table family. In this case, customers is your root table, right? And your, in this case, your sharding key, the partitioning key is the customer ID. So you would specify partition by consistent hash. You define your uh, sharding scheme and you're specifying on which uh, column you want to shard. And you're also specifying your table space set on what table spaces you want to create this table on. And there is another clause called partitions auto. What you're telling here is you create 12 partitions and map each partition to the table spaces that are just created automatically. The system manages the mapping of the partitions with the table spaces that are spanning across uh, multiple charts, right? So I have 12 partitions in this case, and I have 12 table spaces. Each partition is mapped to uh, one of these table spaces. So that's the root table. Uh, what about my child tables, right? Uh, similarly, we have create child table, in this case, orders. But if you see, um, I use partition by reference. What I'm doing here is equipartitioning. partitioning. I'm inheriting the same sharding scheme at the orders level also. So essentially, um, I'm creating customers P1 and orders P1 uh, that are literally um, partitioned on the same customer ID column. If I have line items, I would do the same as well. 
right? So later on, I'll show you how we map customers P1, orders P1, line items P1 to a logical unit called a chunk. And that would be the unit of data moment. The chunk would be the unit of data moment. So once the sharded tables are created, I would go ahead and do the create duplicated tables, in this case products, which needs to be uh, duplicated on all the shards. Okay. Uh, remember I just talked about chunk, uh, which is nothing but um, a group of table spaces of related partitions of tables in a table family, right? So in this example, customers P1, orders P1, line items P1, even though this, these partitions could be in the same table space or different table spaces, but they're all logically um, are mapped to what's called as a chunk. Right? So if Mary comes in and all her data is in this chunk, in this basically in this chunk, which has customers P1, orders P1, and line items P1, okay? And then this is the unit of data movement for resharding. When we add shards or remove shards, we move data, right? We move data, and when we move data, basically we're moving these chunks, right? So uh, one question that comes to your mind is what's in a shard, right? A shard basically contains n number of chunks. In this case, I'm showing chunks one to six, right? And also, uh, in addition to the chunks, you could have one or more duplicated tables. I could have products table, geocode table, or whatever. And I could have a set of duplicate tables. In addition to that, I could have uh, n number of chunks. Okay. Um, we talked about schema creation. Now, how do I propagate the schema, right? Remember I mentioned uh, you don't have to go to each shard and create the tables. You would go to the shard catalog and execute your details there. So first you connect to the catalog via a, via a specific service. You set your session to have a shard uh, enabled, right? enable shard DDL, and then you will go ahead and create table space set, create table spaces, or create tables, uh, the sharded tables or the duplicated tables. And the shard, the master shard director, which is elected by the system automatically, uh, will make sure that these DDLs are propagated to all the shards, whether these are sharded tables or duplicated tables. In the case of duplicated tables, um, we leverage uh, read-only material as used to synchronize these tables uh, periodically. Okay. Sharding methods. Now, I mentioned that we do support three types, right? Uh, the first one is system-managed sharding, uh, which is um, done via a consistent hash scheme, where a range of hash values are, are mapped to a chunk. In the case of user-defined, the two types, range or list, where in this case, a range of shard key values are mapped to a chunk. And in the case of list, it's a range of, and the list of uh, shard key values that are mapped to a chunk. And of course, we do support the combinations of range consistent hash, list consistent hash. I'll sift through these slides um, in the interest of time and show you some examples of how you can create uh, each of these, okay? So in the case of system managed sharding, as I mentioned, uh, scheme is done uh, via consistent hash. The data is sharded and resharded automatically. The system does it for you, and you get an unified, and uh, you get a um, evenly distributed um, uh, data across the n shards. Right, and uh, the imp important benefit is the automated uh, balanced data distribution. If you want, if an application needs a balanced data distribution, which is done automatically, uh, then this is what uh, you would choose. System managed sharding is a default uh, for Oracle sharding. Uh, in terms of how would I create it, uh, we've seen this example before. You would say you would create a table space set. In this case, I have uh, 240 chunks um, and I have two shards. So basically, I have 120 chunks in one shard, uh, the other 120 in the other shard. Right? Once this um, table space are created, uh, I do my create sharded table and I say partition by consistent hash and partitions auto. Basically, I'll create 240 partitions and map to uh, each of the 240 table spaces. Okay. That's system managed. Uh, in the case of, um, uh, in, in, in this case, basically what we're doing here is uh, 0 to 2 to the power of 32 is broken down into n number of chunks. In this case, let's say the chunks are defined as uh, 1024. I'm basically creating uh, 1024 ranges of data between 0 to 2 to the power of 32 and I'm mapping each range to that chunk. Okay, essentially that's what's happening behind the scenes. Uh, 
User defined sharding is primarily used for um, uh, regulatory compliance and support of hybrid clouds, etc. Right? Um, it's it's useful uh, when you when you want to have uh, different shards at different locations, different platform, different application technology. If you want to have full control on how your data uh, should be placed on, uh, placed, um, then user defined sharding is the way to go. Um, but it won't be uh, uniform data distribution. Uh, it all depends on uh, which shard is being used heavily. Right? Um, in the case of system manage, it system automatically creates stable spaces across shards and maps it across, right? Um, in the case of user defined, you have to, you as a DBA will have to uh, do this table space creation as well as the uh, mapping of uh, partitions. Right? So essentially, when you create a sharded table, you say partition by list over the state field, right? And then you create partition P Northwest, article in Washington, uh, it's mapped to table space TBS1, right? Which is here. Likewise, you do two, three, and four. Right? So explicitly, you would have to define your table spaces as well as mapping. You have full control on how you want to do the layout. Uh, composite is an interesting one, wherein if you have a requirement wherein I, I, I want to have some set of shards for gold class customers, some set of shards for silver class customers, right? and I want to have that level of segregation, but within the subset, um, then you want the data to be uh, partitioned uh, by consistent hash. If you have that requirement, uh, composite sharding is a, is a good way to go. Uh, here it is, uh, where I have two sets of shards. Uh, gold class customers have two high-powered servers, and silver class customers have three low-powered servers. Right. And first thing first, you do create table space at TBS1 in the shard space um, for gold, and there's another shard space for silver. Right. Create your table space set, and then uh, you would go ahead and do a create shard table, but you list out uh, the super shard key, which in this case partition set um, by list, you do the over the class field first. That's a higher level of sharding. And then within each class, you can do consistent hash over the customer ID. Right? So you can do that composite sharding um, uh, effectively for having different set of shards for different classes of users. All right. Now let's talk about data dependent routing. Uh, we talked about two types, right? Single shard operations and cross shard operations. What we have done is we have enhanced our Oracle integrated clients in support of single shard operations. What do I mean by that? Our JDBC, UCP, OCI, OCI.net now can recognize shard keys. As part of the connection checkout, you can pass a key, and then uh, uh, these uh, basically these keys are used uh, in routing the connections to the uh, right shard, which has the data relevant to that. Right? Likewise, we also support cross shard queries. This is for aggregation of data, uh, simple reporting, et cetera. All right, let's talk about session-based uh, routing via shard key. The application client passes the key first, right, which is used to route the request at a user's session level during a connection checkout. Right? What the shard directors would do is they look up at the routing map info and understand, oh, this key belongs to this particular shard. Let me reroute, redirect that connection to the shard. And from then onwards, the application uh, we'll talk to the shard directly, right? So one optimization we have done, um, as part of the first connection to a given shard, this connection also retrieves the ranges of shard keys that are in this particular shard. There is a lookup table there um, that's, that's retrieved and kept in the application connection pool. This happens at the first connection. So, over a period of time, when the application spawns connections to each of these, the, the ranges of uh, keys are cached in the connection pool. So what do, uh, what's the advantage in doing so, right? So the biggest advantage being the connection pools take the responsibility of uh, shard directors, right? So they can take a key and go directly to the shard, bypassing the shard directors completely. Right? And they call this as fast path, and this is very fast and scalable. So in, in at runtime, your connection pools are going directly to the shards, completely bypassing the shard director. Right? Um, uh, here are a couple of API calls that uh, I want to show, um, just to highlight some enhancements we have done as part of UCP and other uh, APIs that I just mentioned. Basically, you have a create sharding key builder. You build your key, 
and you would uh, pass it as part of your create connection builder as part of your checkout of connections. Right? So if I don't pass my key, uh, what happens? Uh, then you would establish a connection to the catalog database. We call it coordinated DB. Coordinated DB parses the SQL and sends the SQL to the right shard um, where the data exists. Queries get executed at the shard level, and the data is brought back and sent back to the client. Same is the case for cross shard queries as well. Uh, again, this is the 20% workload that I talked about. This is done only for developer convenience, and this is not for high performance. Okay. Um, the, the final phase, the last lifecycle management. The, in the lifecycle of a sharded database, of course, you want to add more shards to scale your workload data and users. As you add more shards, um, remember I talked about chunk, which is a unit of data movement. We use the mechanism of chunk um, to uh, move data to the newly added shards to rebalance uh, data across all. And we, behind the scenes, we use the RMAN incremental backup and transportable table space mechanism. Okay. So that's the online edition rebalancing of shards. Um, chunk split and move. Um, if you want to split a chunk, um, uh, in, uh, starting from 12.3, it'll be 100% online. Uh, it'll be initiated by DBA. This is done for user-defined sharding. Uh, we do provide automatic move of free sharding. When you add new shards, we automatically move chunks, right? And you also have the flexibility of selectively moving a specific chunk as well if you want to eliminate hotspots, right? And move is practically done online. And uh, remember, we, I said we use Arman uh, incremental uh, uh, table space, uh, backup and uh, transportable table space technology. Um, we take an L0, uh, and then we, when we take the last L1, we convert that chunk into read only. Yeah? Uh, and then we take that uh, backup and then restore and recover it. During that time, you have an opportunity either to reconnect or access the data in the read only board on that given chunk, right? And of course, uh, whenever we do the split, move, read only, or add shards, remove shards, uh, we do have earnest notification. The application connection pools are told about the, the, the topology changes automatically. Uh, so NetNet, in summary, why do we use Oracle sharding versus NoSQL data stores? Uh, that's because it's best of both worlds. It gives you best of RDBMS capabilities. And of course, best of NoSQL. Uh, ours is a multi-model database. We support relational, JSON, XML, Oracle Text, et cetera. Uh, we are talking about standard SQL and programmatic interfaces that you have been used to all along. Uh, PL SQL, OCI, JDBC, uh, these are the interfaces that you have been using and they are, uh, they are supported in the Oracle sharing platform. Uh, you get developer agility with JSON uh, that we have started as part of 12102 and sharding uh, supports JSON as well. We give you ACID, uh, better consistency than most uh, NoSQL databases. Uh, we are strictly consistent within a shard. As you've seen, uh, all the related data is always kept within that shard, right? So it's, uh, it's strongly consistent. Uh, we, our schema is in the database. It's not in the application. Uh, and the, all the enterprise class features, whether it's security, backups, um, uh, compression, uh, ASM, all these time-tested technologies um, uh, that you typically get with a mature RDBMS like Oracle are uh, supported in the sharding as well. Uh, and of course, you can leverage uh, all the DBS skill set uh, in house and worldwide, plus the extreme scalability and fault isolation. Okay. All right. Uh, um, to conclude, basically, sharding is a complete platform for uh, sharding an Oracle relational database. It's ideal for OLTP applications that require the greater levels of scalability and fault isolation than uh, can be achieved by scaling up or scaling out a single database. 